Are you confident of your intubating procedure with a critically ill patient? The British Journal of Anaesthesia in 2017 has produced some guidelines. Let's go and look at the human factors. Okay, so the human factors, according to the NAP4 guidelines, were the most prevalent factor when looking at error in intubating of the critically ill patient. We start with the environmental factors. So there's a recognition that the intensive care environment is not the ideal environment for intubating. There's lots of equipment around the bed spaces, there's chairs, there's ventilators, getting to the head of the bed isn't ideal. So one has to recognize that it's not an ideal environment. And the consequence, there are a number of things that one can put into play to make it more ideal. So one of the things they mention is a standardised airway trolley. This is a trolley that sits perhaps remote to each patient but can be brought over to the patient when that patient is to be intubated. So there's a standardised set of equipment on that trolley that can just be wheeled over as and when is necessary and that's something that we use in our unit. There's also a recognition that a lot of the equipment on the trolley, sometimes there's too much equipment, sometimes there's too many choices of equipment. We need to make sure that we use the minimum set of equipment required and that that minimum set of equipment that everybody is familiar with and is happy to use. We also need to make sure that there's a good use of checklists and algorithms. Checklists are very important to make sure that you're set up properly, everybody knows what jobs they're doing, everybody knows how things are going to occur, and everything is to hand that needs to be to hand, and everything, drugs, etc., are all ready to go in the right amounts, labeled properly when you are ready to go. And when things do go awry, we need robust incident reporting systems in place and it needs to be an open, no blame culture so that we can get the best out of the incident reporting, we can get the best out of examining what went wrong. We need to make sure that people are happy to discuss this in an open, uh, in an open way. There's then a very good diagram, which you can see here, um, about the various compositions of the teams, depending on the numbers that you've got. So they talk about four, five, and six, and you can see the composition is gonna vary. And obviously this composition and the numbers that you've got is very much dependent on the situation you're in. I think it's probably unusual to have six members in a team. I would imagine most of us probably may do with more like four or five. Certainly if you're on a night shift in another department, then you may do with what you've got. But this is some of the roles that they talk about in these particular teams, the four, five and six. And that's where we go on to team behaviour and um, team performance as well. Um, and this is where you need to um, have a good team leader. So it talks about a hands-free team leader. And this is a little bit like the ALS model really, that you've got somebody who's going to lead the team, but their hands off and they are overseeing the whole procedure. So some of their roles, for instance, will include allocation of tasks to the other members of the team. So they're telling the other team members what their role is, what their responsibility responsibilities are and the pathway that their responsibilities are going to take as the intubation process goes on. I think the other thing that's important highlighted in the document is that the team leader very much wants people to be able to speak up. Now there is um, a call for or, or very good reasons why um, there should not be too much talking during an intubation process but equally the team leader needs to make those team members aware that if they think something's not happened that should have happened or they've spotted something that's gone wrong that no one else has seen then they should be able to speak up as well. And the final point here as well and it comes back to what we said earlier um, in the first section is that pre-briefs and checklists are very very important so that comes back again uh, pre-briefs what we're going to do, the order we're going to do it, what we're going to do if it goes wrong. So there we're going to be talking about plan A, plan B, C, etc, etc, um, and when we're going to call for help. So those are the important parts of the team, the team management and the team leader. The next point they make under human factors is about how to manage cognitive overload. And one of the systems they recommend is the Vortex approach. And you can see behind me there's a, a good website with a good explanation about the Vortex approach. And the Vortex approach is about managing the intubation of the patient in a structured way. And it's about managing it either with uh, an, a, a face mask, 
a subglottic apparatus, so uh, an LMA, or by an ET tube, and if necessary, then going into the neck. And it's about having only three attempts at each one of those, and as you fail at one, you move on to the other, and you don't hesitate to go for the um, phone or the front of neck access if necessary. Um, and the Vortex approach is a very good system. There's a good website, which I'll link to underneath, um, and there's a great video on there, which will take you through exactly what the Vortex approach is and what it's all about. The last section under human factors is about the need to call for help and the fact that that call for help should be done earlier rather than later. It may be that you call for help from other specialists, so like the head and neck surgeons for example, and once that help has been called for, you need to give them a clear, structured handover. And they use something called the snappy tool, which I'll talk about in a moment. Also be aware that a more junior member of staff may, call, may, may turn up from that call for help, but when they do, the fact that they're more junior shouldn't mean that they can't be assertive enough in saying, I am more expert at this, you need to let me take over now. So there needs to be an awareness of that. It's not about seniority, it's about the right person to do the right job at the right time. And finally, I just want to talk about the SNAPI tool which they recommend when doing handover. And SNAPI stands for stop, notify, appraise, plan, prioritize, and invite comments. And if you can keep that in your head, then hopefully that's gonna give you a good, clear structure for handing over to the specialist that has just turned up, appraising them of the situation, inviting their comments, because they may well think of something that you haven't thought of or the team hasn't thought of um, that may well help rescue the situation. So I think the snappy tool is a very useful, and as you can see, stop, notify, appraise, Plan, prioritize, and invite comments. So a very, very good tool, I think, and something that we should all bear in mind. So that's the human factors of tracheal intubation. There's much more to cover, which I'm hoping to do with more videos. If you want access to those or the other videos that are on my channel, then please remember to subscribe or comment down below. I'll look at those comments and I'll answer you as soon as I can. I hope you find these useful and we'll speak again soon.